Good afternoon, community. I am Michelle from here at Pasadena Humane. Um, if you haven't been with us before, I am the Outreach Events Coordinator at Pasadena Humane. And today will be our last webinar of 2020. Um, it's very bittersweet, but we have a great webinar. Um, I'm joined today by Fernando Diaz, our own behavior manager. How are you today, Fernando? I am doing well. Excited to be here. So we're excited to have you here. This is, you know, I know it's one of those burning questions on, you know, should I give my pet, my kids a pet for Christmas and how do I make those right choices? And I can tell you, I was guilty of that about 12 years ago, um, <laughs> you know, but I didn't know all of the great things that you're about to share with us back then. We all do it at some point. I, I was telling you earlier, I just adopted a kitten for Christmas, so it happens. <laughs> so uh, before we get started with all of your great knowledge, I'm going to go through some webinar reminders for those of us that haven't been here before. All right, so if this is your first time joining us, these are a few reminders that we have. This is an audio visual presentation. So although you can see and hear us, we cannot see or hear you. So with that said, you can use the question box on the right hand side of your screen to ask any questions. And I will go ahead and ask those of Fernando as time permits. Okay. If you would please save your questions to the end, you may come up with a burning question, but he could answer it um, during his presentation. Okay. And so as I did mention, today is the last webinar of 2020, but we've got a lot of great things planned for 2021. And we'll be back on January 13th with a free webinar talking about backyard birds, um, what they are, the unlikely places that you can find them. And that will be joined by Taylor Paez of the Pasadena Audubon Society. Um, and further in January, we will be doing DOGA with our very own Alyssa Stanilin. And this is a fundraiser for our organization. So it's only $15. Grab your pet and you know, let's get exercising. Okay. If at any time you've got to get up and walk away or you miss any portion of this uh, webinar, it is recorded and will be sent to the registered email address. Um, and so without further ado, take it away, Fernando. All right. Okay, so yes, um, as Michelle said, we want to talk a little bit about the idea of bringing home a pet for Christmas. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, before we begin, I do want to say that while I'm going to be throwing out a lot of um, cautionary tales, things to watch out for, things to be careful with, this is in no way, shape, or form any kind of judgment. As I said, I just adopted a kitten a week ago. Um, and some you know a dog can make a great pet it can be a great experience for your child it can be a great experience for your family so again no judgment just things to kind of keep in mind so as we begin we're going to talk about things to consider you know what what goes into bringing home a pet um how do you pick a puppy uh, which believe it or not can actually be a rather complicated process sometimes who's responsible for that puppy who's going to be taking ch uh, care of it um things to watch out for because there's a lot of potholes along the way in, in having a puppy and letting it grow up to adulthood and then i, I do want to touch briefly on what happens when it doesn't work out what are what are our options what are things that we can look at um, and lastly of course open it up to questions so one of the things i often get when i'm talking to uh, potential adopters in a shelter you know i'll tell them about a dog's history, uh, what we know, what behaviors we're seeing, and they'll say something like, can we just try it out? And I'm gonna be honest, that's one of my pet peeves because it's, it's a living, breathing organism. And just like 
uh, people who have gone through traumatic experiences, sometimes foster system children, the more change, the more times you go in and out, the, the more of an effect it has on you. And so these puppies can have some long lasting effects just by being tried out, if you would. So my point here is whether you're talking to a breeder or a shelter professional, listen to them. What information they have to offer is probably going to be pretty good information that can help you prepare for and decide on whether this is the right animal for you. The other thing I want to talk about is a dog's life. So let's say you're, you're getting a dog for your eight year old and a dog is going to live what 12, 15 years, maybe at some point, your kid's going to go to college, move out, and they may or may not be able to take that dog with them. That's something you want to think about because you're going to have an adult dog now, an older adult dog, who potentially spent his entire life just bonded to this one individual. And suddenly that person's gone. And if you can imagine uh, waking up one day and someone you hold, you know, that someone dear to you, someone you love, someone you care about, vanished. You don't know where they went. You don't know what's going on. They're just gone. That's the very essence of, of trauma to me. And that's the way the dog sees it. They don't know that little Jimmy went to college. Little Susie moved into a studio apartment. They don't know. They, well, all they know is this person's gone. And again, it doesn't mean you can't adopt a dog or, or bring home a dog, but you want to think about that. You also want to think about where you're going to be at that point. Because if the child is unable to take the dog with them, and maybe the dog is older now, maybe has some age-related issues, are you going to be in a place, do you think, to really want to deal with that? Just things to think about, not necessarily a um, deal breaker, if you would, but things to consider. Lastly, and this is big, puppies are fragile. There's a lot of things in our environment that can harm these little puppies as their uh, immune system develops. And it's time for that immune uh, system to develop. So they're fragile. Um, there's diseases like parvo out there. And these things can be very expensive to treat. You can end up in a situation where you have a puppy that is just pulling a lot of money from you, a lot of time, and a lot of energy. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people come to the shelter relinquishing their young puppy because the dog has parvo and they can't afford to treat it and they don't know what else to do. Again, not a deal breaker, but things to consider. What that means is you probably shouldn't be taking your puppy to, I don't know, the supermarket, the um, pet store, the dog park, any of those places until they're a little bit older, until they've developed a little bit more. So Fernando, let's uh, launch our first poll question. Oh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen. What are things to consider when bringing a new dog into your life? Uh, is it personal value, budget, breed, or all of the above? So, and I'll give our audience about 10 more seconds to go ahead and answer. All right, most of our audience says all of the above. All right, we've been paying attention. Uh, there is a lot that goes into bringing home a puppy. Um, all right, so the age old question, do I shop or do I adopt? Um, now I'm obviously biased. I work in a shelter world. And so I'm gonna say adopt, but realistically speaking, honestly speaking, it's gonna depend on you, your personal needs, what you're looking for, budgetary, um, influences. Um, there's a lot that goes into that and you need to decide what's going to be the best option for you as an individual. Um, if you're looking for a particular breed, you may be looking to, to shop. You know, um, Great Dane puppies aren't always you know, easy to come by in a shelter world. There are certain breeds that are maybe a little bit harder for you to come by. And as you select that breed that you prefer, that might influence your decision. And there's also other things that are going to go into that and, you know, being able to talk to someone who's responsibly uh, bred these animals and who, who know a little bit more about them. And sometimes some of them will actually offer a guarantee where they said, you know, we've done genetic tests and we'll take it back if anything goes wrong. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. But at the end of the day, that has to be a personal decision 
based on your values. All right. So as we talk about selecting a breed, um, you know, I love that little meme on the side there because for those of you who have not had puppies or who it, it's been a while since you've had puppies, their teeth are needle sharp and man, they mouth on everything. So it's definitely a, a handful sometimes. But as you select a breed, we need to be looking at what is it you're looking for in that individual? Are you looking for a companion animal, a hiking buddy, um, a couch potato, someone to play with the kids? You know, there's all these different things that kind of go into that decision-making process. Um, are you looking for something that can live well in an apartment versus a house or maybe even bigger, you know, property? Um, those are all things you need to consider and think about because that's going to influence what breed you decide you want, um, assuming you have a particular breed in mind. Uh, one of the things to look at is how is this going to affect my life? Because if you get a hiking buddy, but you're a couch potato, you're not really going to mesh well because this is an animal that's not going to adapt, not likely going to adapt well to couch potato life. It's going to want to have energy release and that may affect you. Likewise, well, let me change that. Um, one thing to look at is look at the breed or the, the, the behaviors you're looking for and then use that to help you select the breed. So as you're looking at these animals going, I want someone who's gonna be highly active, someone who can, I can run with, um, someone who you know I can do all these activities with, then you can start researching and looking at, okay, what breeds fit that criteria? Versus looking at a breed and going, I'm going to make this my pet and not really thinking about what that animal needs. That said, I do want to say every breed has, is going to have outliers. I've heard of, you know, hunting breeds that don't want to hunt, that have no prey drive, uh, high energy breeds that want to lay on a couch all day. So you, you may do all that research and still find yourself with the exception to the rule. But it's generally going to be an exception, and these tendencies that these breeds have usually play out pretty well. Now, if we do decide to go to a breeder, I highly recommend you insist on meeting the parents. If they either won't let you meet the parents, or you meet the parents and they're not what you're looking for, you know, maybe dad's roaming th through the acreage and mom is bouncing off the walls. That's a good indicator of what that puppy is going to be like. You know, there's a certain amount of genetics that play out in how that animal interacts with you and its world. And so if you do go to the breeder, make sure to visit with the parents. Get a good idea of what it is you're bringing home. And then I put together a couple of slides here just talking about some popular breeds and some of the issues they tend to have. Now, we'll throw out, I am not a vet. I am not a medical professional. I Googled some of these health issues. So I'm not gonna talk much about the health issues, only to say that breeds do tend to have specific issues based on that breed. Um, there are certain animals that tend to have certain medical concerns. It's not always gonna be the case, but it's something to be aware of, something for you to research on your own. I will talk briefly about some of the behaviors though. And so Huskies will wander. I can't tell you how often I have had Huskies come into the shelter who are in great condition. They've been spayed or neutered. They have their collar, their microchip, you know, every sign that they have a responsible owner. And their owner comes in and goes, yep, I let them out to the backyard for a quick potty break and they jumped over the fence, took themselves for a walk. Or high prey drive. Now, Huskies tend to have a high prey drive. I also have a friend who's got three or four Huskies and just as many cats. And he literally has them line up, cat, dog, cat, dog, to eat their meals without any issues. So while Husky Stoots tend to have a high prey drive, that's a great example of a situation where you might have an exception to that rule. Cattle dogs. Cattle dogs are known to herd. And so while they, I'm not gonna say they can't be a good family pet and, and cannot necessarily work with children, it's something to be aware of. They're known for nipping at heels, especially when those little ones are running around. They can be destructive. 
And bear in mind, these are animals that were bred for herding purposes. They were bred to be suspicious of strangers as a potential threat to that herd. And so you have a certain amount of breeding that takes place here where you can have an animal that has a distrust of strangers and maybe um, growls or barks or more when strangers come to the home. Something to be aware of. They also have a tendency, if they're not given a job, if they're not given a focus, they kind of like a motor with no load on it. So it's just burning and burning and burning, going faster and faster. And you end up with behavior issues. I've seen many, many cattle dogs that have this hyper focus where they will go after shadows on the wall or you know sunbeams or things like that. And they'll actually ram into the wall, the floor, trying to attack this dot that doesn't exist. And a lot of it has to do with what work they've been given. Have they been given an opportunity to really exercise that need? No list would be complete without a chihuahua. Very, very common. Um, and just as common, partially because of their size, they tend to have a fear-based aggression issue. Oftentimes it has to do with lack of socialization. It's very easy to keep a small pet like that manageable and in the home without really bothering to socialize, without taking time to maybe introduce them to new and novel situations. Um, you know, there's, they, they need that socialization just as much as any other animal does. Um, they're also small. You know, your average chihuahua can be picked up by a hawk. And that means that they're kind of got that prey item kind of mentality where they need to protect themselves. They also oftentimes have issues with house training. The ones that I've typically interacted with have, diff have definitely had issues with foul weather where it's cold, it's wet outside. And I'd rather go on the carpet than go outside in the cold and wet, especially when my belly's so close to the ground. Um, and they bark. Not always, again, there's always exceptions, but there's a tendency to have them barking at strangers, barking for attention, barking when they want something. And I threw this one in here. Not many of you will have hounds, but as I am a lover of hounds, blue tick coon hounds, they tend to have a high prey drive. They were bred, again, to uh, chase game down. They can be challenging to train. I can vouch for that. And they can definitely be vocal. Um, you know, they're, they also tend to have ear infections. I, I will speak to that. Um, the big ears it just happens a lot with my hounds. Whenever they get a bath, they get their ear cleaned. And that required training. When I first brought home my blue tick, he would mouth my hand with some force. Wouldn't break skin, but he let me know. I don't appreciate you messing with my ears. And so I had to work with him and train him and build comfort and confidence so that he would allow me to mess with his ears so that I can keep him healthy. And for those of you who have not heard a blue tick coon hound, look at that face. Yeah, that's my copper. Um, and, and you guys are getting a very, soft, soft version of how loud they can be. I will say he is a good looking guy, Fernando. <laughs> I thought you said that. So, uh, all right, let's uh, go into another poll question. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. What are some responsibilities with a new puppy? A new puppy? So there are no responsibilities, feeding, training and cleaning, or just cuddle time? If only. So I'll leave it up for about three more seconds. So, and everyone in our audience said feeding, training, and cleaning. Yeah, there definitely could be a lot of work. But it can be rewarding. I will say that as well. All right, responsibilities. While it's Tempting to say, I want to give my child an opportunity to be responsible and to um, learn what it is to take care of a, a living being. It might not be the best idea to leave them in charge, as that picture on the bottom kind of illustrates. And I'll tell you, there's countless times where I've had animals come into a shelter 
where we ask the owner about the, the how often do they eat, what do they eat, uh, sometimes they've had medical issues and we're really needing to know this information. And it's, oh, they get fed every morning. How much? Well, I don't know. Bobby does it. Who's Bobby? Oh, that's my seven-year-old. I've literally had someone who was seven years old left in charge of feeding a dog. And, you know, while it, it, it's good for kids to learn, I will definitely support that. I think we need to have some sort of involvement in that situation because um, it doesn't always work out. And you're probably wondering, we're talking about dogs and he's got a picture of a fish on his slide. And that's a reminder for me because I do want to sh share a short story that kind of illustrates how badly this can go. When I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to have dogs and my mom was allergic to cats. So I had fish. I had a big old 50 gallon fish tank. Uh, but I was also young, and while I like to look at the fish, generally I was more interested in going outside and playing with the guys. And so my mom, suspecting that I was not taking care of the fish, she went and took the fish food and hid it. And then she came up to me and said, hey, Fernando, when's the last time you fed the fish? And I lied, and I said, oh yeah, I fed the fish this morning. And she said, well, I'd like to see you feed them right now. And I was so very busted. Um, not only did I lie, but I had not been responsible in taking care of my fish, my pets. Um, and as an adult, I look back and I go, yeah, okay, I lied. I wasn't being responsible. And is it really reasonable to expect a small child to be responsible for these animals? Especially when life and death literally is, is in, in the picture here. Um, and to this day, I occasionally have these nightmares where I find all these fish tanks in my house that are dirty, you know, dirty water and fish that are, uh, haven't been fed for how, who knows how long. Um, and it's it affected me since then. But the point is, while it's great for kids to be involved, you know, with walks and feeding and training, I love the idea of kids being involved in training. They can't do it for the adult. The adult needs to be involved in some way, shape or form so that that child knows the proper way to take care of those animals. Okay, and at this point, I do want to talk a little bit about kids and dogs. Um, you know, that picture on the right, you have an adult kissing the dog, and um, I can tell that that dog is very uncomfortable. And for those of you who don't know how to read behavior quite as well, um, the obvious signs are he's leaning away, he's leaning into that wall pretty hard. Um, and if you look closely, you can actually see the white of his eye. We call that whale eyeing. That's, that's a sign of discomfort or fear and his tongue is out. Now, sometimes when dogs lose their teeth, their tongue will hang out, but I'm pretty sure he was licking his lips at that point. And that's also a sign of discomfort. Now, I've been guilty of hugging and kissing my dogs. I'm not gonna lie about that. Um, but you have to have that relationship and you, you, you risk. Um, and in that situation, I mean, I don't know what happened after that picture was taken and I hope no one was hurt, but there's definitely some concern there. Um, you know, there's a potential for that woman to be harmed in engaging with that dog. And she probably doesn't know any better and doesn't mean any harm. And then I look at that picture on the bottom there, bottom right with the child sitting on the dog. And I'm reminded of people who tell, have told me that, oh, their dog is great. The kids can do anything. They pull their ears, they ride them like a pony. And I cringe because that child is in harm's way every time these things happen. And they don't know any better. You know, that adult doesn't know any better with that Rottweiler. Are our kids gonna know better? Probably not. So it's really important that we actually teach our kids responsible ways to interact with our dogs so that they have a good relationship, so they're not harmed, so that they can grow up to appreciate. And hopefully when they have kids, they can teach their kids how to be responsible with a dog. I had a, a boss once who said that a good dog should allow a child to do anything it wants to, to them. And I could not disagree more. Now I'm gonna show you guys a brief video next. And I do wanna throw a caution out there. Um, it's, it can be a little bit traumatic. There's no blood and gore, nothing gross like that, but it's definitely um, impactful, I think. Now, 
I see the dog shrinking its body down, looking away, ears back, furrowed brow. He's uncomfortable. Now, no one wants to see that happen in the home. And that woman, I'm sure, had no clue that that was gonna happen. Now, given what we can see in the video, it's very apparent that that dog did not wanna be in that interaction. It was cornered, had nowhere to go. And while it did escalate, it also quickly moved out of that situation. It said, you know what, I had to escalate, but I don't want to, I'm out. Um, now, I hope that that never happens to any of us, anyone listening or anyone I know. But we have to be respectful of the dog's space to avoid that. Um, you know, these, these dogs have their way of communicating and that dog was, was very, in my eyes, clearly communicating. He was not comfortable. Now, I'm not gonna say it's okay that he escalated or she escalated with a child. However, I will say it was preventable. That's something that did not have to happen. Um, you know, at this point, that dog's gonna probably suffer. You know, I, I can imagine that dog being brought into a shelter um, because of that parents no longer feeling safe. Uh, likewise, that child suffered. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have any kids. I can't really say how old that kid was, but potentially scars, physical and mental there, potentially afraid of dogs in the future. And again, it was preventable. So if you take nothing else away from this presentation, monitor your children with their dogs. And if you can't, it's okay to remove the, the dog from the situation, maybe put up a baby gate, maybe put the child in a playpen, um, manage the situation so that you don't have to supervise. But it's never a good idea to just leave children alone with a dog. All right, uh, we're gonna launch another poll. Um, and I think this goes would go nicely with what's next in your presentation. So what is meant by puppy proofing? So we've all heard of, you know, child proofing our houses when we have babies. So I've had to do that a couple of times. So are we looking to keep your puppy safe from hazard, give them a room to run around, or is it a magic spell so they have invisibility? So, all right, Fernando. So everyone says keeping your puppy safe from hazards. What do you have to say? I thought it was a magic spell for sure. You know, I, I sometimes I, I guess I think puppy <laughs> proofing maybe, you know, like when we're baking and we give them the time to grow up and, you know, run around. I like that analogy. Uh, and I love that picture there because until I found that picture, I did not know what the inside of a couch looked like. <laughs> and, and and now I do know. And that Poor little beagle there. He, boy, he had a good old time. So yes, puppy proofing is is very important, and depending on the individual and and their breed and genetics, it may mean more or less work. You know, sometimes it's enough to put up a baby gate or put them in a spare room, and you're good to go. Um, sometimes something more needs to be done. I had a friend who adopted a corgi puppy, and while I did not see the pictures. What she described was the dog ate her kitchen cabinet. And I can just picture bits of wood everywhere, you know, as the dog either teething or bored or um, just having too much energy and no release, destroy the place. And so definitely need to make sure we're careful with that. Uh, one of the things I'm reminded of with the kitten I adopted is you got to take care of electrical cords because she loves those cords and she keeps coming over and she kind of look at me, is he watching? I'm gonna go grab this. And then she, I look at her, she stops. And it's not like she's actually testing me. She doesn't know. She just knows that I keep shooing her away from the cords. So that means I gotta put those away or protect them in some way. Likely in this situation, we have an animal who's bored. And so it's really easy to say, you know, they're mad at me, they're getting back at me. But in reality, it's oftentimes they didn't get enough energy release. They didn't get um, the attention they wanted. They were just bored and wandering about and found a, a thread. So they pulled at the end of the thread. Um, and some dogs are gonna be easier to work with than others. Um, my hound dogs, 
Yeah, I came here from Colorado and we'd go hiking in the mountains and I would be exhausted and they'd be rearing to go. But then I discovered if I leave scent trails, if I use, uh, help them to use their nose to explore their environment, suddenly they're the ones that are exhausted and I've got plenty of energy because it's minimal effort on my part. So really just kind of realizing what the, what the breed tendencies are and what your indiv this individual's tendencies are can help you with a lot of that puppy proofing. And then management. If we don't want them drinking the toilet, we close the bathroom door or we close the lid. Um, trash cans. Just close the trash can. Have it secured. Um, counter surfing. Very common. And it's oftentimes situations where I keep spices or snacks on a counter and them getting into those items, that's reinforcing it right there. That's self-reinforcing behavior. And so it can become very hard to manage unless you just clear the counter. And if there's nothing on the counter, they're less likely to climb on it. And I just spoke to someone who was talking to me about digging and they were saying their dog digs, digs in the yard and it used to be okay because they dig in one area that they were okay with. And then they decided, you know, that rose bush would look a lot better if it was horizontal. And that's when they got in trouble. And so leaving the dog outside to be on its own can be a recipe for disaster. Definitely a lot goes into puppy proofing. All right, I'm gonna put up one more poll. Um, what is meant by flooding? Is it letting water flow freely, making slow interactions, or forcing a puppy to face his fears? Well, Oh, I tell you, Fernando, our audience is, they really know what they're talking about. Maybe they should be presenting. So uh, we've got uh, kind of a, a couple of different answers here. So okay. we've got some say making slow interactions and others say forcing a puppy to face his fears. All right. So. Flooding is definitely a traumatic event for animals, including humans, and it's forcing them to, to be exposed to something they're uncomfortable with or are not familiar with um, in a large quantity. So it's the best example I, could, I usually give is I don't like spiders personally. So if you lock me in a room just crawling with spiders and I'm not allowed to come out until I'm calm, that would be flooding. I probably would pass out before I was calm. I don't know if that counts. I've also seen, I used to work with marine mammals, adults holding their children over the dolphin pool going, it's okay, they're not gonna hurt you, they're friendly. And meanwhile, that kid is kicking and screaming. And two things wrong with that. One, dolphins think it's really funny when they bite. Um, and two, the kid doesn't care what you have to say. They're, they're being flooded. They're, they, they can't handle what's going on right now. And that's scary. And the problem with flooding is that it can actually lead to an individual having a worse experience. And so using the spider example, it can lead to someone actually being more afraid of spiders than before. You know, it's a very, it, it is done by therapists, but it has to be done in a very specific way. Otherwise, it, it leads to problems. Socialization is a gradual introduction. It's a positive introduction. Um, I had a client once who their dog during one of its developmental stages, which dogs go through several stages. One, they're fearless, and the next one, maybe a week later, they're terrified of everything. Um, and during, the, during that fear stage, the dog knocked over a broom, and it was a loud clatter, and I, I think there was definitely some uh, fear there. And so to work with that, we ended up creating a positive association, using treats, letting the dog choose to approach the broom um, in a slow manner. And that's how you kind of create a more positive socialization structure. And so this is something that a lot of professionals will argue about, you know, what is socialization? What is, you know, puppy classes? And it, it's really important that it's done slowly, really is the bottom line, and, and in a positive manner. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly 
we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so everyone here is very much aware of that. Um, and one of the things that I discovered when adopting this kitten, things don't come as quickly as they used to. You know, I ordered a specific brand and type of food that I couldn't find in the stores because the shelves were practically empty. And it arrived earlier in the day before the kitten did. And, you know, I had someone delivering the cat, so it was, I didn't have a whole lot of flex on that. I went to the pet store to try to bring her some toys, and there wasn't a lot there. You know, the items are out of stock. There's, and even if you go online, there's delays in delivery. So there's a lot of um, issues that come around with a pandemic. And training is harder. You know, we talked about socialization just a moment ago, and I get a lot of calls from people going, you know, when are you going to have classes again? And we can't, it's just not safe. Um, you know, in a pandemic, we can't have live classes like that. Um, but meanwhile, these puppies are in a crucial developmental stage. A lot of the, their development, a lot of the most important things happen in the first seven months. And if they miss these things, then neural pathways close, their development moves on. And some things we can catch up with and some things, they go away. And that was our opportunity. And so that's something that, that's a huge thing from a behavior standpoint to consider when you're looking at, do I bring home a puppy right now? I mean, one of the bigger things is really, can I provide it what it needs in this moment? And then I look at what's gonna happen once these vaccines come out and we're, we're past the pandemic. I suspect there's gonna be a lot of dogs dealing with separation anxiety. Dogs that have spent their first four, five, six, whatever number of months, year, with dad and mom around all the time and suddenly you're gone that's another trauma and so it's definitely going to be a, a challenge in um going back to work and there are things we can do i mean we can create opportunities where we're gone for a little while and um, start to slowly acclimate the dog to our, our the lack of our presence um but we have to be thinking about this for it to happen otherwise before you know it you're going to be going, looking at your clock going, I go to work next week and, oh my God, my dog just ate my couch. All right. So you've listened to all the stuff I had to throw out at you guys. You've decided to pick out a dog. You've adopted or purchased a dog. You've done everything right. And still you find yourself in a position where it's not working out. Now, there are pitfalls along the way. I was just telling someone recently, it's hard for a professional to fully and completely socialize a dog, let alone people who don't know. You, know, they, you don't know what you don't know, and there are things that are intricate parts of the development that you may miss on. Um, but either way, no matter how you end up there, you find yourself in a position where it's just not working out. First and foremost, I always recommend management. You know, um, if the if, if, if you have your kids with the dog, keep them separate. Keep them, you know, control the situation so that you don't allow whatever bad behavior is occurring to occur as best you can. And then get help. You know, there's a lot of organizations out there. There's a lot of trainers out there. Some are certified, some are not. Some are certified by Bob Smith Dog uh, School, School of Dog Training. Um, where, you know, Bob Smith trains you himself and then says, hey, here's my thumbs up, you're certified. Some are national organizations, like the Center for Professional, the uh, Council for Professional Dog Trainers, excuse me. Um, some are international, like the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. Um, certification does not necessarily mean you're the best trainer. It means you've passed some sort of exam, some, some more rigorous than others. It means that you've shown you've had a certain depth of knowledge, but just like some people can teach and some people can do, and some people can do both. You know, there's, there's, there's a variation in there and there's variation in experience. I was training long before I got my certification. And so certification really comes in handy when you're looking at specific and, and, and significant behavior issues. So if you're looking at some severe separation anxiety, and by severe, I mean this animal's in distress, it's eating walls, it's tearing things apart. Um, not, it whines when I leave. Um, you might wanna get a certified trainer at that point. 
Not that the whining when you leave is a bad thing or, or should be ignored, that is, um, but that might be able to be handled by someone with a little less experience. You know, certain certifications are very specific. You know, for reactivity, which is another thing I, I suspect we're gonna be dealing with a lot of um, after the pandemic, there are organizations that focus solely on reactive behaviors and how to work with them. Um, and if you've got severe reactivity, you might wanna find someone in that particular field. Usually for most issues, a general trainer is fine. Just make sure that you're comfortable with their training methods. It's something that you feel you'd want done to your children. Um, vets typically don't have a whole lot of actual behavior knowledge. A lot of it's gonna be anecdotal. Um, not that working with vets is, is a bad thing. Um, I love the vets I work with, um, but I often find that it needs to be a trainer and a vet and an owner working together so that you have this um, triangle of communication occurring. So the vet knows what what's the best medication to provide based on the behaviors we're dealing with. And even then, a lot of vets, you know, they have a, they, they focus on, on their work, but they may not have a lot of behavioral knowledge as far as medic medications work and how, how medications affect animals. Um, so bottom line, when it comes to vets, I highly recommend having a trainer work with you to work with the vet, but I also recommend asking questions. Um, I had a vet recommend a medication for one of my dogs and um, I said, hey, doesn't it have this side effect? Can you tell me more about that? And we decided that was not the best medication for my situation. But I might've gone ahead with that original recommendation had I not stopped to ask questions. And I think almost every vet's gonna be welcoming you're asking questions because it means you're interested and you wanna know more and you wanna be a, an informed owner. Then we have behaviorists. Behaviorists go through specific schooling. Um, and it's very focused, and so they know a lot of the ins and outs of how the, how the mind works. Um, so depending on your situation, you might want to be looking for a behaviorist. And lastly, we have vet behaviorists, um, which we have a couple in LA, at least one that I know of. Um, and a vet behaviorist, they work, they, they basically, they've gone to vet school, they've, got, they've done all the behavior schooling as well, so they spend a whole lot of time in school. And so they're able to apply that behavior knowledge with the medical knowledge, uh, which is not something that most individuals can do. Not always necessary, but with severe situations, it could definitely be helpful. Um, and if it's just something that you prefer, I mean, that's okay too. So we try finding a trainer, we try working with these animals. Okay, it doesn't work. Let's look at rehoming. Um, you know, rehoming, is, it, it can be a valid option. Um, I think it's really important that if you're rehoming, you are honest and transparent. Don't downplay the behaviors you're seeing. You know, there's a reason that you are deciding that this animal is not gonna work for you. And so have that conversation, let them know, hey, this is what's going on. This is why I can't deal with it. Um, and we can even help with that. You know, on our website, we have a home to home option where you can post pictures and actually, um, give a little blurb and, and talk about why you're looking to rehome. Um, and it's, it's we, we don't, we're not too involved as a shelter, but it does give you a little bit of help in finding a, an appropriate home for your pet. Lastly, we have the shelter itself. Um, and, I, and I do wanna say shelter, relinquishing your pet to the shelter should be a last resort. Um, when you've tried everything else, um, we are here, we are here to help by all means. And, it's a stressful environment. Sometimes animals don't behave as well as they could. Um, placement can be difficult. And so definitely wanna look at other options before you go down to shelter just so that you give your, your pet the best option that they do have. All right, so I've talked to you for a little bit. How about you guys toss some questions my way? So, Fernando, earlier in the presentation, you showed um, the video with the baby. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some things that could have been done to prevent that a situation similar to that? Oh, I'm glad you asked. You know, first and foremost, recognize that that dog is curled up in the corner. You know, even if you don't know how to read behavior and you don't see the furrowed brow and the ears back and everything else that I kind of touched on, recognize that that dog has nowhere to go. 
and the baby's trying to climb on him. So let's just separate them, real easy. Now, we can work to build a good relationship um, and, and really involve the baby. Uh, and one of the things that I really love to do is actually use training for that. And so it doesn't have to be direct, um, but maybe doing clicker training where you, use a, you can get a clicker at any pet shop. And the, generally the way it works is there's behavior that occurs, you press the clicker and then you follow it up with a treat. So maybe you're sitting with the dog and the baby and the baby's in your arms and the dog has it, a route out and you just, the dog looks over at the, at the kid. Click, here's a treat. Dog sniffs the kid. Click, here's a treat. Um, you know, you can create that positive association. Um, and the nice thing about it is clicker training affects the brain in a way that you're releasing endorphins, you're feeling confident and comfortable. And so you're actually creating a positive association with that child because just because he's sitting there, just because he's involved. Um, that said, if you do have a history of issues with the baby where the dog is repeatedly maybe growling, snapping or whatever it may be that's inappropriate with the baby, I definitely do not recommend you, you allow the baby to get too close. And, and that's really probably a good point to get a trainer at that point. You already have an issue. Um, but if you don't have an issue, if you're just trying to create a positive association, association from the beginning, that's a great way to do it. Okay, um, another question that we have is, so we've talked about um, setting some boundaries, but what do you think are the best ways to help uh, teach the kids to respect the dogs? Well, it's gonna depend on the age. And, and you know, the, the video we showed, uh, that child probably wouldn't understand if we just said, you know, the, the dog doesn't like this or this is not comfortable. Um, but with older children, ha just having them involved with feeding, um, you know, guided feeding, uh, maybe even walk, maybe having them do some of the training we talked about, um, that can definitely teach them appropriate ways to engage. Um, and I'm a huge fan of, rather than saying, don't do this, or that's not okay, or that's bad, let me show you what to do. And so, you know, I've seen kids that'll come up to a dog and they roughly pat him on the head, almost hitting him. Um, hey, Susie, he doesn't like that. Or Mikey, he doesn't like that. How about we do this? And you guide them in gently petting the dog and show them an appropriate way. Uh, I think that goes a long way because you're feeling a need. That child has a desire, a need to engage with the animal. They want to have a positive association or a relationship that is and you're giving them a route to do so. Okay, is there a certain age that you would recommend bringing children into training, training with the dog? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I don't have kids. I'm not as quite as knowledgeable on, on children as I am on dogs. Um, I will say it's gonna depend on their cognitive ability. If they, you know, I've seen young kids that really pick things up quickly. And if they can figure out how to do the training and, and what's involved and sure they can come in younger um but even if they're super young like the example i gave with the infant earlier you can still do the training with the child present and create a positive association um it can be you're operating the clicker because they don't have quite the functioning ability to get the timing just right but then you click you give the kid a treat and the kid throws a treat to the dog they're still involved Okay, so I, you know, just out of uh, general curiosity, I know that you've been training for quite some time. Um, actually, I don't know, maybe you could turn your camera back on too, so we can actually have a, you know, I want yeah. a conversation. Um, yeah. But hey, there you are. Um, I know that you've been training for a long time. Is there anything in your experience as a trainer where you've actually worked with families as a whole? Absolutely. Um, I've often had situations where, um, for example, the dog is jumping up and knocking children over. And in that situation, oftentimes the dog just wants attention. And this is how he's getting that attention, whether the, you push the dog down or you yell no, you're still giving them attention. And so we work with them. And de again, depending on the child's age, we'll talk about, okay, you're gonna play this role. Uh, maybe you toss a treat and I press the clicker, or maybe you do all three and I, I work with you on that. Um, 
it all depends on the child's ability to kind of really understand. Um, but it's also important to involve the parents so that they can understand. Most situations where I'm doing consulting, I'm actually really working more with the human part, part of the equation than the animal itself. You know, I work with the animal a little bit to kind of show uh, functioning, how, how training functions and to help the owner to understand how to do the training um, and also to build some confidence so they can see that it can happen. Um, but then it's up to the owner because at the end of the day, I'm going home. I'm not going to be living with them. <laughs> so they need to know how to work with that, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of like board and train situations only because you're not involved. And so I think it, it can be a really awesome experience. You know, sometimes I'll just tell the kid, okay, you just turn your back when a dog jumps on you and mom, you do this. And we kind of build it, an equation together where we're working together to, to train that animal. So, and I wanna say like, this is, um, you know, one of the biggest parts of what it is we do with our humane education is really teaching the kids that yes, they wanna have those animal interactions, but how to have those appropriate interactions with them. And, you know, your team has been very integral in helping us to teach them when we have our summer camps and we do bring in, you know, the dog behaviors or even when we have our kids clubs, um, you know, and it's just, I do think that it is very important um, to really start them, start the kids young. And yeah, I, I do agree with you that, you know, behavior is um, much more a people aspect than it is an animal aspect. Absolutely. Um, you know, when, when I do training, whether it's through the shelter or privately, my focus is on that relationship. And so I, you have to involve the people for that. Um, but a healthy relationship, you can get through a lot, just like with, you know, human relationships. You've got a healthy relationship, you can meet a lot of challenges. And so yeah, if, if the relationship is broken, that's really what needs to be fixed. Um, but if you've got a healthy relationship and you've got behavior problems, you're half the battle's done. You can get through the, these things. Um, or at the very least, you can have honest conversations about what, how far you're willing to go. Um, but there's a lot you can do when you have that trust when that animal knows that you're not gonna harm them. Yeah, so um, I would say another thing that came to mind when you were talking is about um, how the, you know, our brain is really pliable in the first seven months of life or so, but, you know, because we have been quarantined for nine months or so, how else can we get socialization for our animals? Great question. Um, some things are, are more of a challenge. Um, dogs really, as puppies, need to be around other puppies um, to really learn how to communicate dog, if you would. Um, it's a huge, huge thing, and they have their first five months or so to get that done. So that's something that's, I don't, that's gonna vary. I mean, as dogs can both have been shown to be able to contract COVID and also be a vector, they can pass COVID. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of dangers there. Um, but if you have someone you know who has a puppy who you trust and, and you, you're both practicing caution, you know, appropriate cautions, you may be able to let them engage that way and at least get them some sort of social interactions. Um, the other thing is, and I touched briefly on this when I talked about socialization, is just new and novel things. You'd be surprised how often dogs are scared of carpet, hardwood, grass, things we take for granted, stairs, and introducing them to these things, you know, people in trench coats, big hats. Um, you know me, I always have that cowboy hat on and I've been called on to come say hi to this dog with your hat so he, you can see how he responds. And so these are things that we take for granted. Basic fundamental parts of life that as humans, we say, okay, yeah, so he's got a hat on. And for dogs, the minute you put that hat on, you're a different creature altogether. Yeah, I will say I've seen in the shelter that we've had, um, you know, dogs uh, act adversely to men with facial hair. Mm-hmm. You yeah, know, we, I've got a, I got it all here. You know, long, long hair here, <laughs> here, hat. <laughs> so, and how has that affected you know working with the dogs in the shelter? It can definitely be a challenge. You know, I've had situations where I've actually I usually have my hair in a queue and I'll let it down um, just to kind of help the dog along. I don't do it too often, but uh, there have been situations where dogs have responded better that way. Um, 
it's also really good because we're dealing with oftentimes with dogs that we don't know their history. We don't know where they came from or what, what behavioral problems they may or may not have. Um, it rules that out. Okay, do you see a guy with a beard and cower or do you lunge and try to bite? Good information to have either way. Um, and then once we have that information, we can figure out how best to work with it. Okay, and this is just my question, totally random. Um, is there like, okay, so we have a kitten and he mm -hmm. was our foster fail. So he's now about nine months old. Um, and so we, he came to us right after COVID and he was only like a day old. Oh. Um, so yeah, he was a little, little tiny guy fit the palm <laughs> of my hand and now he's over nine pounds. Um, but one of the things uh, that we tried to get him to do is we actually put on a uh, cat school, found cat school on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And we put it on the TV just to kind of see so he can get, see other cats in a different way and you know how they're doing that. So are there any things like that for dogs? Absolutely. Um, it, it's going to vary from individual to individual. Um, but I have a friend who does, she's, she's very, very active on Instagram. Um, so on a daily basis, there's at least two or three videos of her dog. Um, and she calls it borking, but he, he'll go crazy and bark at things and everything. And I'll play that for my boy, Copper. Mm -hmm. And he'll bay it back at it and he gets all excited. Uh, in my case, it's very easy because he's very sensitive. You know, there's a dog on TV that barks. He's like, wait, what, what was that? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it depends on their, their interest, their, um, animal videos, just regular, like wildlife stuff. There's birds oftentimes can be entertaining for them. Um, other dogs, all kinds of st things can be highly entertaining and enriching for them. Um, just right off of YouTube. So, yeah. So now, and you know, right now we're, while we're pretty much all stuck at home is this like a good positive outlet for to get them socialized and desensitized and that type of thing absolutely um you know right now my dogs are in the living room while i'm in here talking to you guys and before i came in here i know it's quiet makes me nervous um <laughs> i turned on my alexa like here play some music uh -huh. they love it as a matter of fact i i noticed a huge difference where if i'm not actively engaging with them and it's silent versus there's some sort of background noise and when I left them, they were sleeping, just listening to the background noise. Um, you know, when I leave for the day, I crate my dogs. And I, one of the things I do, I have another Alexa in their room. My dogs have their own bedroom. Um, and I turn it on. And so, they, you know, they have an opportunity to listen to music because the hardest part for any dog is that initial um, vacancy of you're, you're gone. Mm -hmm. And so my dogs don't have separation anxiety, thankfully. But just to make it easier for them when I leave, they get a treat and they get some music. All right, sounds good. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today and imparting your knowledge on this. Um, if anybody should have any questions in regards to behavior, how would they get a hold of you? The easiest way is if you jump on our website, we have our behavior helpline, um, and it, takes, it has two different formats. One, for quick and easy questions, we have a 15-minute phone call we can do with you free of charge. Um, and the other one, we can actually schedule a 30-minute Zoom consult where we can sit down face to face and talk about what's going on. Um, those are $45 um, and we try to make it as easy as possible. So when you go on the website, you can actually schedule your time that you're available for us to make contact with you. So I love that it's convenient for the consumer. Um, you know, I wanna thank everybody who has joined us today, who has jo joined us um, for every webinar that we've had since April. Um, I do look forward to 2020 when we've got some new and exciting, or 2021 actually. Yes, careful where, there. <laughs> where we've got some new and exciting things. I do want to remind everybody, if you missed any portion of this webinar, um, it is recorded and it will be sent to you tomorrow afternoon. So um, happy holidays to everyone and, uh, and a meowy Christmas. <laughs> You know, awesome. and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye. Thank you for having me.